Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our panel this morning. This is a 10-year discussion we had 10 years ago in IGF in Bali in 2013, and we're really I'm really excited to have it today uh, because there's so much that has happened, and a lot of it we, we didn't predict, but yet the internet was happy to take on all the new excitement of the next 10 years that. Uh, we had from 2013 to 2023, and we're going to discuss how we're going to manage it going forward. So uh, the key questions we're going to discuss today are where were we 10 years ago, where are we now, and where are we headed, and how are, is the forward planning that brought us into the healthy, vibrant ecosystem that we are currently enjoying going to, to bring us forward on this? So today on my panel, I have next to me Glenn Dean, who is a distinguished engineer at Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, Paolo Lanteri, who is an, at the, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And I've got Constantinos, uh, who is with the, he's a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Society and was a senior director at uh, the Internet Society. And uh, Jeff Houston is on, <laughs> you, can, you can correct that if you need to. Um, Jeff Houston is with the chief scientist at APNIC, who should be online joining us. And then eventually we're going to come over to Stella over here, who is uh, studying governance and policy at the, and is with netmission.asia. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, let's start off, uh, Glenn, we're gonna start with you. So. What, what have we learned in the, the past 10 years, and what do you think are the dominant um, issues that really helped the internet and the network infrastructure grow in that 10 years? Oh, thanks, Shane. Um, gee, that's an interesting question. You know, 10 years ago, when we did the Bali panel, uh, it was really early days in terms of internet video. We had uh, some streaming services were popping up. <clears throat> we had uh, sort of the initial foray into scaling the internet to handle uh, content uh, at, you know, with millions of viewers instead of thousands of viewers. And I think that looking back, uh, we met those challenges pretty effectively. You know, uh, despite uh, dressing up today, try to blend in with the adults here at the IGF, uh, I am an internet engineer. And uh, from an engineering perspective, we had a lot of challenges back then. Uh, Video takes a lot of data. Video is a lot of data. And as you add more video, you have even more data on the network. And as you add more video, you add more watchers. And that's even more data on the network. And we've scaled the networks very effectively in the last 10 years to the point where we don't really ask the question, can I do video over the internet anymore? We don't ask the question, can we do video uh, easily between us? I can now walk down the street here in Kyoto and I can live stream back to my family in Los Angeles. That's remarkable that I can do that uh, over the internet. And I don't have to ask anybody's permission, and I don't have to you know, jump through a bunch of hoops, or I don't need a crew to do it. I just use my phone. And that's quite remarkable. So I think that you know, looking back from where we were at 10 years ago to where we're at today, it's, it's, a, it's a success story from an engineering standpoint. That's my area. That's what I can talk to. We've succeeded. We're not done. Uh, there's new stuff ahead. One of the big changes that we're going to be talking about, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is we've done a very great job at video on demand, which is typically pre-recorded movies and television shows from a professional standpoint. Uh, and the next frontier is live stuff, live sporting events, live uh, broadcasting your child's soccer game to your grandparents uh, who are at home in maybe another state or another country. And, and, and bringing live to the experience of streaming uh, and, and video on the internet. But we'll talk about more of that in a few minutes, I think. Great, Paolo, you um, have been working in this space for quite some time and there was a lot of concern about how IP rights were going to get managed back then. Uh, I don't know, it, it just seems like you have done a very efficient, effective job of getting the collaboration of a lot of people who didn't want to get along 10 years ago. So. Talk about your success. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. I rarely start my intervention with uh, an apology, but uh, it's, it's uh, in given the context, I must do that. Uh, on top of being an international civil servant, I'm a lawyer, an IP lawyer, so I'll try to keep myself uh, understandable. And I'm heavily jet lagged and it's 8.30, 8.45 in Japan. So I-, I We I'll use that to handicap the lawyers. So, um, so the situation um, 10 years ago was a completely different one. Uh, um, we were very um, uh, 
uh, cautious in, in a, and uh, the best we could get out of that discussion was that copyright was still relevant for promoting content but needed to adapt. Put it in other word, uh, it was mm, ev mm, evolve or perish, basically. Um, and uh, among many people at the IGF, secretly or sometimes openly, I think the majority were sort of hoping uh, towards, <laughs> they are lagging towards the second option, like they were, they were thinking that the copyright was going to not resist uh, to the technological evolution, or in any case, was could not stand uh, through the evolution of the internet. I think 10 years uh, uh, later, we can all agree at least on two points. We're not saying everything is perfect, but copyright didn't perish, it's still here, and users had uh, as an unprecedented access to the widest variety of content in all sorts of fields, meaning even on like live uh, uh, music and sports events, UGC, news, fake or um, quality news, uh, news, anything, anything. So basically we can, that's already an answer. Copyright did, didn't stu uh, stand in the way of the healthy development of distribution of content. I'm not saying everything is perfect, uh, but there are still many challenges, uh, but copyright succeeded to deliver, continue delivering the mission of uh, incentivizing creation of content and therefore access to it. And went through this sel natu natural selection process, almost or Darwinian uh, memories, I think matured from many lessons learned, but also stronger and, uh, and reinforced. Um, because uh, the content creator industry uh, is, is in much better shape compared to 10 years ago. Here I must make a, dis uh, make a disclaimer that uh, not not industries are the same, so it's not the same talking to the music industry than the press industry or like publishing or video games, of course, and among those uh, sectors there are different players. So again, it's not the same talking to um, music producer or a session musician. That's, uh, we can delve in uh, to that. Um, how did we do that? Uh, of course, this was, there was a development, an uh, evolution uh, that was much needed. It happened, it was revolutionary and covered several aspects. One, from a norm setting perspective, we had unprecedented changes in the, norm, in the norms, in legislation. Nothing, uh, nothing similar happened in the past. Copyright uh, reforms were at the, in the table of legislators all over the world, for the, and still are, was a headache of legislator. Countless, uh, in it, I mean, directives at European level, Music Modernization Act in, in the US, Australia, UK discussing one, South Africa, Nigeria just implemented one, Uruguay yesterday, countless everywhere. So the system had to evolve and is evolving, but the most extraordinary changes I think are in the way copyright is exercised and licensed. And, um, and so stakeholders made, um, sat down at the table and found a way to make things that were unworkable, finally workable. Um, I won't dig into details now, but happy to do it later. There are three uh, many success stories, three very re well related to what was discussed 10 years ago. One is open access, open source, open licensing and all that. I think it's almost a settled issue. Back then we were saying uh, copyright is not fit for purpose uh, uh, because there are so many open uh, crowd initiatives going on and uh, IP is not serving those purposes. That was not the case, is not the case because actually it's flexible enough to make it happen, plus limitation and exceptions. I want, I mean, happy to, to develop on that. User-generated content. Literally, there was a, a one, one of the outcomes of 2014, uh, IGF was UGC, user-generated content, is a non-resolvable issue. It's, it's showcasing how copyright and reality are completely displaced and mismatched. Why? Because for any one of us, taking a video and synchronizing a song or modifying a picture found on the internet, 
entails a number of copyright exclusive rights. So you need to ask the permission to do that individually. Back then it was individually. You want a piece of music on your video, you need to go and knock at the door of the producer to get that. Similar, you get a picture online, you need to ask the permission to do that. So we were saying, uh, it's not going to work. And rights holders were saying, yeah, but you cannot do that. 10 years from now, we have TikTok, we have <laughs> Meta, we have Instagram, we have countless UGC services that are legal and we can discuss, people are unhappy about how much money they're getting, but that's another issue. So copyright showed it can be adapted, that's a business bargaining power discussion. The other gr great success story is streaming, but it would give me, I mean, I would need at least uh, half an hour to end, but streaming in, in 2013 was like, wow, it's gonna destroy the music industry. This cannot happen. And now the music industry is built up on, I mean, over, I think it's 63% of the music market uh, is, is, uh, is digital these days. Uh, and uh, of course, not everyone is equally happy, but um, things are, are working well from everyone, users and, and stakeholders. So I think those are the success stories and we can discuss more about uh, the details of those changes and what's next. Thank you. We'll probably come back to several of those issues. Uh, Constantino, you were on a panel yesterday that was talking about fragmentation, and when I thought about it, I thought, you know, this, and this came up as well, that some people's fragmentation is actually just a distributed network. Uh, it depends on where you sit and where you're, where you're thinking about this. And so in the 10 years that we have been discussing this since 2013, how are the distribution networks do, faring on this, and are we getting into more challenges with governments because of what uh, we just heard about with all this new content? Or are the networks not affected by the fact that we just have lots of content and it's making it where people want it to go? Well, hi, everyone. Um, and thanks for having me here. Um, just a small correction. I am no longer with the Internet Society. Sorry. Uh, yes. So I I said uh, was, <laughs> just make yes. sure okay. that, you know, it, this is on the record. Um, right. So. One of the things, I think that over the past 10 years, there have been um, a lot of lessons learned. Um, I remember when I started 10 years ago um, at the Internet Society, funny enough, I was hired to do copyright and I was hearing that, you know, there were some strong voices that were claiming that we need to kill the internet because it's going to kill uh, copyright. Um, and of course this didn't happen. Uh, and of course both copyright and Paolo is absolutely right. Uh, both copyright and the internet adjusted uh, and they found a way to collaborate, right? They found a way to coexist in a, in a system that, and in an environment better yet, that is evolving so fast and it's changing so fast. And I was having a conversation with Glenn this morning and we were talking about, oh, perhaps we, you know, could we have predicted the TikToks or the user-generated content that blow, uh, exploded or the streaming services? And if we had predicted that, what we would have done? And we both concluded that it's actually really good that we didn't predict because it demonstrates both the um, flexibility of copyright, as uh, Paolo said, but also the ability of the internet, you know, to, to bring us new challenges all the day, uh, all the time, and adapt to those challenges. Um, I think that w what we're seeing currently, and what is really fascinating for me, is that the way um, content is created has exploded. Right? There is really not content creation is no longer a monolith. In the old days, you had very specific actors that were creating content and they were very much responsible for the distribution of this content. But right now, literally everyone is creating content and the tools that are allow you to create content have multiplied exponentially. Chat GPT, so AI tools, uh, augmented reality. Uh, you have influencers that are creating content and they're claiming copyright. You have all these different services that allow you to be part of this copyright regime that was so very much exclusive in the beginning uh, or be before the internet and in the early days of the internet. Now, I think that networks had to adjust to that reality um, and they had to figure out how to cope with exactly what Glenn said in the beginning, video because that is where we are right now in terms of the internet from a user perspective. Users want to stream. Users want to watch video. Users, I mean, 
you know, they, they want to have access to content that is as um, interactive as possible, right? And I think that this is going to accelerate as the new tools are coming in. So there is a very, very valid question, and I am very, you know, Glenn and I met 10 years ago, practically, and 10 years ago he was telling me that I am working in order to make networks better and more efficient. So I saw him this morning and I said, oh, what are you working these days? And literally he said what I was working 10 years ago. And in the beginning I was like, oh, hmm. But then, you know, you realize that this is exactly what we need to be working on, right? How to create, how to make the internet more efficient for users to create and consume video, uh, sorry, content, because not everybody wants to create content, but there's a lot of uh, consumption. So we are at a place, I think, we are at, at a very interesting place where I, I have to admit, and I never thought that I would say that, we are seeing, you know, if copyright and the internet were in a relationship, were in, you know, in the beginning and they were not really getting along, right now they're sort of, you know, they have figured it out, they have their tensions, they have their marital problems, but they're not divorced, which for me is a really, really healthy place to be uh, in many different ways. So we have a healthy relationship that is continuing to blossom. We we're going to go to Jeff. Did you need to get in there? Are you having an intervention yeah, yeah, already? I, I, intervention. I do have to ask, do I need to update my job description as marriage counselor? Yes, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. All right. That would be great, actually. Do we have Jeff online? Yes, yes, you do. Hi. Okay, fabulous. All right. Thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Sorry we're not having you here in person. So you uh, join the gentleman here, but you are also, um, how are we doing technically? Have we done, has it survived as well as it feels like to the, the common user? It seems like the technical aspects of the internet have just flourished and you guys have been doing an amazing job on the back end, making sure all this content gets delivered to where it wants to go. Um, over the last 10 years, oddly enough, I think we've rebuilt the internet completely. It's not what it was 10 years ago, and it's certainly not what it was 20 years ago. The transformative technology, oddly enough, was the evolution of mobile phones. Mobile telephony, after a very torrid start, took over telephony. The sheer convenience of having it in your pocket all the time transformed that industry. And when that industry then turned from the initial sort of offering of the iPhone, but then everybody has a mobile internet device, it completely transformed the internet. Because all of a sudden, this wasn't the library anymore. We weren't curating data. These weren't institutions of knowledge. We'd become an entertainment business. And our population wasn't just a few million. All of a sudden, we were looking at a global market of billions, billions. Now, that massive expansion, the mobile industry certainly coped in giving everyone cheap internet devices. And the content industry was under extraordinary pressure, I suppose the prize motivated, the money available, to create entertainment across that platform. Now, a long time ago, 15 years, the network was used to get users to the services they wanted to find. It was like a road system. Where are you going? Let me take you there. But you can't scale that. It's too hard. And so under the enormous pressure um, of, of volume, of scale, and money, we rebuilt the internet completely. And it's just as well Moore's Law came and helped us. These days, computing is just prolific. Supercomputers on your wrist is just what we wear. Storage is just abundant like crazy. Terab terabytes of information on your phone, this is insane. And of course, what we're also finding is carriage is now cheap. We talk about moving terabits per second of information on fiber optic cables as if it was commonplace, and it is. That combination has changed the network. Instead of going to find your content, Content comes to your door. Content is right beside you. We've rebuilt the network using content distribution techniques to actually make sure that the content is there just in case you need it across all the major markets of the internet. We've transformed a just-in-case, sorry, a just-in-time, oh, pop, 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 let me get the packet for you, into a just-in-case model where within a few small miles or kilometers, there is literally petabytes of content. And oddly enough, it's not learned volumes of written data. 
It's video. It's all the other things we do. And then we've leveraged that infrastructure to actually provide real-time services, such as this video conversation, where we're actually talking not directly over the internet, but from data center to data center. So we're now living in an entirely different internet. The role of the internet service provider is now local. The larger move the data around the planet, oddly enough, is now being privatized. And in essence, that's no longer a public carriage function, but an attribute of the large scale content data network. And the role of how to publish content has changed enormously. The citizen publisher is now a customer of Azure, Akamai, or any of the other commercial service providers. So it's changed where the money is. It's changed where the content and focus of engineering is. And it's actually changed the engineering and architecture of the internet. Why? Because as long as we can build it like this, it's cheaper, it's faster, and it meets the demands of literally billions of people every hour of the day. So yes, the last 10 years has been a wild ride. Thank you. That's very helpful. One of the issues 10 years ago was the challenge between um, North and South. So have is part of this equalization and the rebuilding of the internet, and this is just an open question for you all, was that there was still this very, this feeling of, um, there was a division of where uh, they were spending money on infrastructure. It's still a bit of, of a challenge, but I think in the point of mobile is a great one, that the mobile carriers and the ability to you know, use the network, I think has we've done some work on that, but is, are we still struggling with a north-south divide or have we done a better job of making sure that everybody who wants to put content up on the internet or watch on, you know, content on the internet now has the ability to do that with some level of device in their hand or in their presence? That's an open question for any of you. No? I'll, I'll I mean, it was in. a question 10 years ago. I'm thinking, are we, have we done better? Um, I, I got to say, no one's asked that question in years. So uh, I think so we solved it? So maybe that's the measure that actually it's not, nothing's ever solved. <laughs> okay. But it's no longer the hot button that all of us are talking about. Uh, you know, as, as Jeff said, you know, we've re-engineered the internet. Uh, part of that has been to make it scale. And part of it is uh, evolving it so that uh, the way the content creators can interact with it and use it has evolved and, and it's not, I mean, is it ever perfect? It will never be perfect. And that's good because I like keeping a job doing this work. Uh, but uh, it, we've had great progress. Okay. So Can I relate an experience? Sure. Yep. Um, coming from India, one of the most dramatic uh, rollouts in the last 10 years has been connecting up hundreds of millions of people uh, across the entire Indian subcontinent. It's an engineering feat. It's truly a, a wonder of the last 10 years. But one of their major targets and major roles was to integrate content provision, those boxes that sort of deliver the streaming data and whatever, deliver that inside their network. So this wasn't a subcontinent, a subcontinent pulling data from the rest of the world on demand. Largely, it was trying to contain this problem into feed the data once and then deliver the data to users many times. And the entire rollout has actually had as much emphasis on integration of content and service into those networks as it did in actually building the network infrastructure that connected the users. So we're now seeing the network and content coupled more closely in terms of the service model we deliver. And that for the internet is a dramatic change in the way we do architecture, the way we do infrastructure, and oddly enough, the way we pay for it as well. So big changes, yes. Great, Constantinos. So I think that, you know, the, the, the north-south south conversation about content is really the, the conversation that we have been having about digital divides, right? Because in order to create content, you need, you need to have connectivity. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, I think that with, of course, the emergence of smartphones and the fact that everybody has really gone mobile, um, we are seeing more content creation and certainly going back, you know, the, 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 you don't need to ask permission to upload anything on the internet as, soon, as long as you have this access to the internet. And that's why it is always important to go back to these very fundamental values of the internet and try to, um, remember that the internet's architecture overall is based on 
some very basic principles and we always need to reflect on how the things that we're doing, whether it's technological things, whether it's policy things, also reflect those values as much as we can. Uh, Glenn mentioned permissionless innovation. He didn't use those words, but you know, he said, I can upload something without permission. And I know that this is a term that 10 years ago was, whoa, no one can really talk about it because everybody was misinterpreting it. But right now we're at a place where we see the value of that uh, principle and of that value. So it, it is very important to remember that I, I, do, I do not have data. I suspect that there is more content created in the North and uh, in the global north and the global south consumes more content than it creates. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done to create those networks, right, that are resilient enough and are able to support um, content creation in those countries. So there is, if, if there is some sort of a chain reaction happening. So we cannot really talk about how the Global South is, is, is sort of creating content if we don't have first a conversation about how it is connected and how meaningful this con uh, um, connectivity is, to use a term that the UN loves. But that seems to be, and I have a Brazilian brother-in-law and he's always introducing me to things that are highly entertaining that I, um, like the Capybara song is my favorite thing right now. So, um, but it's, it's you know, it, it, that is actually just my use of, like my, my network to learn about things that are going on. It isn't a technical feasibility challenge of, you know, the haves and the have-nots that I think that we had 10 years ago. Uh, but I think you, you mentioned several things in your opening statement about, you know, like, well, and your point about you can put anything up, but the question is, should we keep all these things up and realize this is a technical, not so much a content-driven conversation, but thoughts on, you know, what do we do with the fact that everybody can put everything up all the time, yet you've found a way to kind of manage through the challenges that 10 years ago were just hard no, take it down, and now, because so many people are creators, they want to be in on this as well. They don't want to be taken down. They, they want their content up as, as the rest of the world does. Let me also make um, add something about north-south uh, debate and availability of content. I think in terms of creativity and cultural products, the north-south debate uh, is is way um, is a bit old. Uh, in terms of content creation, we have um, countries that are not considered as north. Like right. well, I think well, part of it is Cuba, that we've gotten uh, rid of that thought like process, many which you mentioned. Yeah. In, 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 in Asia, that made a revolution out of uh, their creative economy, like uh, Indonesia, mm, South Korea, and, uh, and African. Uh, so it, countless examples of countries that cannot be considered North that are actually overflowing the world with their content. The best example is, if you look at the charts all over the world about music streaming, who is heading, leading Latino music? And you cannot, uh, and that's, that's uh, a fact, and was enabled also by the technology. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, if you go to a completely different sector, publishing, education, uh, news of day, those remained local content, high in demand, needed. And uh, the technology is enabling all that. Beyond, and I think there is, um, uh, Bertrand in, in the room, so he may yeah, tell something. Is the technology is also enabling uh, things that were unthinkable uh, 10 years ago, like serving the language diaspora. You, I mean, and, and uh, you get people, I mean, Italian diaspora in the, U, in the US, but, or like African diaspora everywhere, they get to access the super compelling, uh, top-notch content produced in their home countries. And this is another extremely good uh, uh, story to tell. Um, and uh, is, there was some fear that uh, it was uh, going to lead to a sort of um, arm, affect the cultural diversity, uh, um, the fact that uh, the, the, the channels were, were sort of handled by a handful of people coming from the north. Uh, in certain instances, it may be the case, but uh, there is a recent study about uh, uh, music charts all over the world and in countries where there are not English speakers like Korea, Japan, Italy, uh, Sweden and uh, the top chart are all national artists. So how mm, did we, I, think, I don't think um, copyright was only part of that solution. 
if you get rid of copyright, that would have never happened. Because those, and I go back to the first question, it depends which country we're talking about. Copyright applies both to my um, small cousin uh, birthday video uploaded on YouTube, mm -hmm. your pictures walking around Kyoto, uh, copyright is applicable. But it also needs to function when you put hundreds of millions of dollars in producing uh, a blockbuster video games, a movie, or you have to pay the salaries of journalists uh, that are informing the world about uh, what's happening. So it, copyright work well in be flexible whenever we are talking about UGC, not necessarily commercial cr created content that allow you to do many things, but at the same time did well in continuing to incentivize and rewarding the investment behind professionally created content. That was a huge challenge 10 years ago, and there were like uh, the, the many saying uh, needs to change because it's not working for UGC. In fact, we are, show, we are showing that it can work for both scenarios. Okay. Jeff, I'm just checking in. Any extra co additional comments on this conversation? Um, yes, yeah, so my part of this, this issue is we didn't build the content network we had today in the way we had envisaged it. We had thought basically 20, 25 years ago of the citizen publisher. You know, my website is as big as your website, even if your name is, is Rupert Murdoch or someone else. We were all able to create and publish our content as equals. That unfortunately never happened. What happened instead, oddly enough, is as we transformed the internet with content and service, we empowered the intermediaries. We empowered the middle agents, the folk who aggregate and license this content and deliver it through content distribution networks. It is no surprise that Google has the size it does. It is no surprise that Akamai is a major player. These intermediaries are actually astonishingly powerful. And what they deliver, oddly enough, is a uniform product to a global market. And so while folks' demand for content may reflect a rich cultural diversity and may honor various forms of copyright, and that's true, underneath it all, we've actually built a relatively weird distortion where a small number of these content intermediaries are astonishingly powerful and astonishingly large, and they effectively dominate this entire industry. My own website, if I hadn't put it into a content distribution network, would be in a lost, forlorn, and very dusty corner of the internet. I couldn't get the market, the attention, the eyeballs, whatever, that we seem to want from this. And so in, in unleashing this enormous amount of content, we've also empowered a relatively small collection of intermediaries to actually assume a very dominant role of control in running and operating these content distribution systems. So winners and losers inside all of this. I think the underlying lesson is the way things pan out never works according to anybody's plan. That what actually happens is technology produces surprising solutions and the amount of, of I suppose, money and the ability of markets to respond has actually meant we've leapt very quickly on solutions that work and then transform the industry every time. Moore's law changes the dynamics of computing and storage every two years. The industry reinvents itself every five. There's no constancy inside this industry. Any business plan that's five years old is not a business plan anymore. It's a historical archive. That's not going to stop anytime soon. So, yes, this is a very live area and demands an extraordinary amount of business agility and risk to play in this game. Thanks. Um, you brought up uh, probably both sports and gaming, which we haven't gotten into, which is, seems to me have gotten to be a, a, a much broader worldwide audience than we might have had 10 years ago. Is that correct? Pick one. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, those are areas where um, we see a constant growth in terms of uh, demand and, and, and offer, and where there is also a busy activity of policymakers in order to make sure the people investing uh, their the, the money in, in, uh, in getting uh, 
the people to watch uh, games and play video games around the world are, are safe. Um, and it's very much linked to what uh, was just mentioned about uh, the power of uh, um, intermediaries. And here, it was never, I, I, I thought uh, at some point someone was gonna say that uh, uh, copyright is, is the reason why uh, everything is centralized. In fact, it's not. It's the only, one of the few uh, areas of law that is standing in the middle, and that is called uh, internet service providers liability or responsibility rules, safe harbors, that are still keeping busy countries all over the world. In this forum, those policies have been seen as the ultimate evil, but in fact are the only way you can actually give control to the producer of the content instead of the distributor of the content. And we also saw another, fa another man, uh, trend that in many instances, there is no more demarcation between producer and distributor, Netflix, Disney, they do them themselves. So it's mm, mm, partially true. So mm, mm, video games, huge, wonderful stories to tell. In those 10 years, their business models shifted completely from uh, a console hardware based business to uh, mostly online global uh, interactive gaming, all covered, but it's, it's an IP intensive industry. What there, it's I, video games is IP, not only copyright of course, but video games, growing fast over two billion, uh, 200 billion uh, uh, US dollar um, projected for this year, meaning that depending how you count it is, is larger than, than, uh, than audiovisual or, and or music uh, sometimes put together. And uh, it's a wonderful story. No one is uh, is uh, is complaining about, and IP was behind it. Sports, it's uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's big uh, big uh, complex debate. Uh, we had the WTO <laughs> ruling on that. It's part of copyright in the sense that it's related to copyright. It's not creative content as such, but there are rights. For, according to broadcasters or people that are um, organizing events to control who is uh, getting access to it. And it has more money involved than the traditional copyright industries. Did, did going to almost zero latency in many places, people should always talk about Korea, right? It was like the reason why gaming was so big there because it really felt like it was just, you were 100% interactive at the moment. And so more places able to come to as close to zero latency as possible, I imagine, has really helped that entire environment as well. And yeah, absolutely. Technology enabled all that, and that's what I forgot to mention, but all these huge and fantastic deals that can be carefully crafted uh, in uh, meetings room with lawyers and business people, at the end of the day, nowadays, they, they count nothing un unless you have engineers make it happen. That's, and and uh, not only in terms of users, so but even in, the make, in making sure the revenues are shared and people are identified, mm -hmm. you need technology. And that is, of course, uh, from both sides. We, we are nothing without engineers. We didn't <laughs> talk about the COVID effect of the fact that all the, all the transit changed in, in its location, but yet didn't seem to cause any real problem with that. So first responders, engineers, we should give you guys more beer in places and say thank you. Yeah. Um, gosh, that's a lot of interesting stuff. I'd like to bring all these, these thoughts from Paolo and, and Jeff together here and, and talk about today and, and, and the unique things that are going on now that, that weren't 10 years ago. So in, in some ways, you know, we, we've said I can describe myself as a marriage counselor. Um, I like to say that I do IP so that you can do IP. I do IP networks, you do IP frameworks. Uh, but we, we, we both work in the world of IP. Uh, and that's kind of remarkable if you think about it. When, when I started doing this job about 10 years ago, and I came to my very first IGF, and I, I started participating actively at the ITF, a lot of people said, well, you're from a, a movie studio. Why are you, what are you doing here? I mean, why? 10 years later, that's not even a question. You know, I was uh, here at the IGF downstairs. Sony, uh, I think it's their, their online entertainment, their games division, is downstairs with a booth at the IGF showing a technical solution for how they delivered game updates 
uh, during COVID and how they completely re-engineered how they did that so that when people were home and wanted to play games, they could get the games and they could get the updates they needed. It was, it, it, it was wonderful. You know, nobody, nobody even questions you anymore why a content guy is at the IGF or a content guy is at the ITF. And I think that's the business really positive aspect of this progression we've seen. You know, we brought the IP frameworks and we brought the IP networking together. That brought, enabled a platform for the business people that pay the bills, that pay for me to do my work and everybody else to do their stuff, to get comfortable with the internet as the platform for their next generation, right, streaming. And that has caused a, an evolution that we only could have dreamt of, you know, back in the day. And what I mean by that specifically, you know, we went from, if you look back to 2012, uh, most video on the internet was either standard def or lower quality. It was 320 by 280. It was really terrible quality video. We went to, from standard def to HD, now 4K, is common on the internet. Each of those little jumps is easy to say. It's four times the amount of data. SD to HD is four times the amount of data. SD to 4K, 16 times the amount of data. NHK has a, even a higher uh, resolution service that they, they have. And what's enabled that is that the business of content creation, content distribution, came to the party and said, this is important. They invested the, the funds, they invested the engineers in advancing those fields so that our codecs are much more efficient than they were in the past. Our network transports have much lower latency. 10 years ago, we never talked about latency. It was just a thing we lived with. Uh, now at the places like the ITF, it's one of the things we talk about the most. It, you know, you know, there's L4S over the ITF, which is an initiative for you know, lower latency. Uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, if, if people say, well, you know, what do you do in your marriage counseling business today? What's your number one thing? Latency is the thing I, I'm working on big time because live sports. And sports brings people together. It isn't just watching live sports. It's sitting in the stadium and be able to chat with your friends uh, on your phone while you're watching the game. Uh, the friends may be at home watching it on TV. I, I literally had the experience of being in the stands and a friend texted me and said, just saw you on camera. Uh, and he was sitting at home and we were waving to each other. That's cool. I, I mean, I couldn't even imagine doing that uh, 10 years ago. But, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to come off as, you know, sort of like, isn't this all wonderful? I think it is really wonderful. It's, it's, it, you know, We've had investment that made problems that we were afraid of go away. And it's opened new things that were interesting challenges like the latency problem to work on. That's really fascinating and, and we continue to evolve. Um, I find that very exciting because it means that you know, we're not done. We're continuing to find interesting things to work on. But at the end of the day, IP networks and IP frameworks, we, we work together in harmony, not always, not always perfectly, but we work together to enable the business guys to go off and do their thing. Now we sometimes say we don't like what they've done. I myself will never appear in a TikTok video, but you know. <laughs> Anyways, Constantine, you have a comment on this topic? Yeah, ju just very quickly, as both Paolo and Glenn were talking, I was thinking that effectively all, all of us that you know we're speaking in at the IGFs or working at the ITFs or you know working at WIPO and and, and thinking of these things. Ultimately, it's all about the user, right? Everyone is working for the user. And I think that what is interesting in the past 10 years is that the user really took us to the direction that they wanted, and they very much indirectly and silently in many ways, they said, we need those things in order to be able to participate and continue participating in the internet. We need better networks because we want that these networks to be able to stream video if I walk downtown Tokyo. We need better policy frameworks because I am seeing that, you know, the licensing regime in copyright has created problems because when I'm traveling, I cannot take the content with me having access to that content. So we're seeing also this change in the way those policy uh, frameworks think about those things. So for me, it's really interesting that we always need to go back. And one of the things that I have realized in, in doing this and thinking about the internet is that ultimately it always comes down to the user. So it is very, very important in those conversations to not forget the users and what they want and not to underestimate where they can take us. Because we are here where we are with all these new technologies and these exciting things happening, whether it's streaming, whether it is whatever, because of the users. Jim, did you have? 
Yeah, thanks, Shane. So we actually have a comment and question from Kat Townsend from the Measurement Lab. Um, 2.6 billion are not, two, I'm sorry, 2.6 billion people are not online and more do not have meaningful connectivity. Access is still very much an essential concern. We work on measuring the quality of connectivity at interconnection points and using those to support increases in services and in infrastructure development in underserved areas. How might we do this better even without reporting from service providers? Who would like to go first? Jeff, thoughts? Do you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, yes, I, I have some modest thoughts here. I mean, part of this is the beauty of markets is also a weakness. That in, in transforming this industry from one that was orchestrated from the middle out, which is where the telephone system was, the telephone company defined what the service was, how it was provided. And oddly enough, one of the defining instruments of, of that whole regime was universality of service and access. And that goes back over 120 years. Everybody had universal service. It was actually echoed then in, in electricity rollouts 10 years later. The internet was never built like that. It was built as a market response. It was actually unleashing that sort of stolid, quite conservative view from telephony into one that chased where users spent money. Now, the problem, as we all find with this, is that the richer the user, the more determined the chase for their money. And so rich markets are extensively served with extraordinary amounts of technology. And the hope is, amongst much of this industry, that as the technology improves, it gets cheaper and gets more accessible to those areas with, with lower versions of you know, per capita GDP and similar metrics. But ultimately, wiring out high-speed networks in remote and impoverished areas demands a level of capital intensity which is challenging for any investor. Interestingly, solutions are appearing which are unorthodox. And I've certainly been tracking where Starlink is going with its service. All of a sudden, over every part of the sea and land on this planet, we can drop in excess of 50 to 60 megabits per second anywhere, anywhere at not eye-watering price, at prices which currently are affordable in a Western context, and if the pace of technology keeps on going, would be affordable universally. Because once connectivity is an abundant good, not a restricted and scarce good, everything changes. We fall into a trap of assuming the world we have today is constant. The Silicon folk think an entirely different view. Everything doubles in two to three years. Stuff gets cheaper, stuff gets smaller, and stuff gets faster. And so the situation we find today will certainly change over the next few years. And I suspect that one of the enabling technologies will be space-based to get over some of these issues with the extraordinary amount of capital intensity required to wire up those parts of rural and remote that the existing technology models won't surface. I applaud an initiative in Mongolia, uh, which certainly has a large amount of extremely remote and sparsely uh, populated areas, and actually doing a, a service based around Starlink to provide modern, extremely high-speed connectivity to astonishingly isolated and remote communities who don't have extensive power. This is all battery power, and it works. So certainly I am optimistic about being able to drop the threshold into more challenging markets. And certainly I see the technology shifts are essential to do that because the existing models won't carry us into those spaces. But, you know, it's an evolving picture. So I'm optimistic. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. I think Project Kuiper just uh, put one of the, they, I think they launched two satellites this past week and I know they were planning on a huge constellation. So is this just a case of we're expecting to see uh, more coverage and we will eventually see a lowering of the price point now that we've proven that you, if you're in Mongolia, you can probably go almost anywhere, but not necessarily pulling wire, but using uh, this, the spectrum that we have in space? There are five massive projects uh, that are certainly on the drawing boards and in various stages of sophistication. Um, so yes, Project Kuiper, 
the existing uh, U3B. Um, there is a Chinese project that's on the drawing boards and of course Starlink. The launch costs are coming down because the launch costs are coming down. We're, we're contemplating an entirely different future now in this area, particularly of rural and remote. And for countries like even Australia and New Zealand, which are plagued by large amounts of sparsely inhabited areas, these kinds of technologies make astonishing difference to a picture of a national community drawn together through a digital sort of medium. So yes, I am less concerned uh, at this point that the situation we have with the remaining 2.6 billion, I don't think it's intractable. I do believe over the coming few years, technology solutions will actually apply to their part of the world as much as our part, the developed part of the world. I always wonder if there's going to be somebody, 10 years ago it was Belize, who would say, come to Belize, we're not connected. <laughs> so you like want a <laughs> vacation someplace where you're like, don't talk to me for five days. Um, I'm going to come over here to Stella. So you um, are studying a lot of this. And one of the things that you mentioned when we were talking in the very beginning is that it's interesting being here in Japan because in Southeast Asia and the area that you were from in the world looks to Japan uh, for a lot of the copyright laws and IP laws that you're, you're currently studying. So talk about that. And also, you're a digital native you really grew up with this so a lot of this might seem like a bunch of wire talk because it's always been there to you thank you for the question actually I just want to hop back to a little bit on the topic of the global south north and south divide so actually one of the issues that we saw during the COVID pandemic was that yes there may be um, you know importance and prioritization in network access but one of the key barriers was the cost of devices so a lot of households in Malaysia for example um, you know bottom 40 of the population, you would see that one household would be sharing one device and it's a matter of prioritization of who gets to use that device and who ultimately gets that access, which relates to what we're talking about for the youth. Um, when it comes to more of the privileged side of uh, perhaps those who have their own devices, so one of the issues or one of the worries that we have regarding content and open access content and fair use of content is that a lot of youths may start out as content creators related to um, maybe fan related content. So fan created art, fan created um, videos, etc. And so I would like to ask the panel later about their um, thoughts on how that may see, I mean, the future of that. Right, yes. And then on the topic of um, IP, one of the things that we also see is that as youth creators, sometimes um, some of the things that we create on and share online gets fed into the algorithms and then ultimately that's an issue that we worry that later on as youth, our work or the work of those uh, who are involved in that community ultimately will be used to feed into a larger uh, program and then we won't get the credit and then we ultimately just have to fade away and choose a different kind of thing that we want to do. So yes, if there are any thoughts on yeah the the youth role and their youth presence, especially in terms of fan created art and fan related. That's um, um, I'm extremely surprised to hear these comments. It's for the first time uh, youth components of the IGF is actually claiming for better copyright uh, protection to make sure their works is not going to be used to train machines, right? Or get lost and attribution to, of your work uh, is granted. Well, on paper, everything should work. It's settled. You have rights in all the countries of the world, not all 181 countries of the world, so practically all the countries of the world, that would uh, assure that you have the right of being recognized, attributed as the author of a work. And you cannot waive it. I mean, you can renounce to exercise it, you cannot transfer it to your um, employer. The, that's the moral right. Then the real answer is uh, how do you make sure, uh, the question, how do you make sure this actually happen? Again, we have to turn to technologists. But there are watermarking technologies, there, are, uh, there is a protection also of rights management information enshrined in copyright laws that are there exactly to serve uh, the purpose you are mentioning. Um, anything else would be t way too technical, but the, the law is already there and also the technology. Uh, there is a huge debate, and it's not about youth, it's about 
all sorts of professional content creators, that they don't want to see their content used to train machines that would eventually put forward output that compete with them. Think about if you were a professional composer or if you are a journalist, or, uh, but that's not specific to youth and this IGF is devoting, I guess, 80% of its meeting time to that debate. Uh, the first question, I, 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 but I think it's the fan art is part of uh, the UGC debate. Uh, it's oftentimes derivative work. So if it's done in the context of platforms, like TikTok or, or uh, Instagram or Meta, Facebook, those practices are often covered and regulated by the terms of use, taking into account copyright. So in certain frameworks, this is solved by terms of use and licensing practices, and that's something that didn't happen in the past. Outside of those platforms, if you create something based on someone else's creation with a commercial purpose, I have a bad news, you need to go and get the permission, but there are clearing houses, there are places like collective management organizations where you go to one place and you get the right to do that. So I understand that to be, it's, a, it's having tool sets that are built into maybe the platform that you choose to put your information on. So you don't have to, you don't have to do it from start. You know, it's like the old days where you think, Jeff, you're mentioning your, your blog and having to make sure that it gets in the right place. And, and so when you're doing this, having those tools will help you protect your work from the beginning. So um, very, very practically, I don't know whether, I'm, I'm not using TikTok, but when, if you do something on TikTok, a video, and you pick uh, a soundtrack, it's identified, yeah. and uh, part of the money that TikTok is generating through advertisement of their business model would go through a collective manager organization to the owner of that song you're using in your video so that you can do that without infringing copyright. But that's within the TikTok framework. If you take that video and you put it, and you, you broadcast it uh, on TV, no, you can't do it, you should get, uh, so it's extremely complex, <laughs> but uh, frankly, uh, there are meaningful progresses in this space. If you ask rights holders, they would say the money received by those platforms are too low, it's not enough, but that's a business discussion supported by some principle established in the norms. D did you have a second question you want to add? Uh, actually, yes, it's kind of related, but I'm not sure if it was already covered, but on the topic of the language barrier as well. So I do know that, for example, youths, um, for we have like a uh, strong online presence, as you said, digital natives. So during COVID, there, the, there was an opportunity for a lot of us to connect if we had the opportunity to connect online. And what we saw was that, for example, um, there are like uh, certain perhaps books or comics, et cetera, that are not available in the native language. And what happens is you get people who offer to translate for that particular piece of work, but it's not an official translation. And then they monetize that. So I think that was that, that's an issue in which like, it's odd to see uh, a youth creator who also wants to have their like, IP protected, but they're also co like, re actively engaging in that kind of um, activity in which they're essentially taking someone else's and translating as well. So the issue, um, any thoughts on that issue? Sorry, it can be a new market. Uh, the first question I have for you, are we talking about uh, human translations? Or are we talking about someone offering to take a text and put it uh, into DeepL or ChatGPT <laughs> translated? Actually both. Well, it's pretty different uh, because uh, anyway, from a legal perspective, if you take a book and you want to translate it into a language that is not offered yet of that mm, version of that book, you can't do it. You have to ask the permission. You have to ask the permission. Oftentimes, I mean, I, if it doesn't exist, it depends on, on, this on, the, on the specific market because that would be literature. Uh, how would you go about translating a, a, a movie? That would be dubbing. It's, it's a completely different uh, story. How do, would you do that for music? So it's literature. There are practices about doing that, but translation of uh, literature is still managed individually. Um, if 
it's done by a human, then that translation is a derivative work, is protected, and you can make money out of it. So go on, do it. Uh, people, are, that's how you expand and spread knowledge around the world. There is need for that, but uh, cannot be done uh, without um, getting the permission. All right, we have, we've done our first hour. Good job, everybody. I am going to open this to questions, and I appreciate that we have people here in the room. Thank you for joining us up here at the large dais. Uh, do you have something online as well, Jim? No? Okay. Uh, Petra, how are you this morning? Do you want to join into this conversation? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Shane. Um, fascinating discussion, uh, wealth of perspectives. Um, I would say, uh, as somebody who works uh, for the uh, uh, professional audiovisual sector, the first thing is I would agree with uh, what I've heard about the false prophecies of 10 years ago whereby copyright was going to break the internet. It's refreshing to hear that uh, there's a degree, a fair degree of consensus that it hasn't. In fact, in terms of uh, our observation of the milieu of professional audiovisual production, one of the hopeful stories in terms of capacity building in the last decade has been the eagerness and success with which young producers in the in certain areas of the global south have uh, accessed the copyright framework, mastered the, uh, the uh, knowledge that they needed in order to support their activities of professional content production and try to build IP values within their companies, which I remind people here is essential in order to have basic access to the capital that you require to pay your employees, to um, develop the next piece of content. We have a very complex product cycle in audiovisual. It takes months, years sometimes to develop a, a project to the point where it can go into production. So uh, this accessing of the copyright framework has proven a boon to uh, content that ultimately ends up uh, on internet services. And uh, it's been, I think, conclusively proven that the two systems uh, are meant for each other. Um, the thing I would say, uh, um, without meaning to rain on, on anyone's parade, the very upbeat uh, story we heard uh, from Jeff in particular, which is indeed very uh, positive, uh, is not always borne out by circumstances on the ground. I participate in a network for called the uh, Policy Network on Meaningful Access. We have a session uh, tomorrow afternoon, I think 3.15. Uh, we'll be hearing in particular from two uh, women who run a company in Kampala, in Uganda, a production company. They've been trying to um, uh, run a sustainable uh, audiovisual production company uh, in this neck of the woods for a while. It's proving quite complex. One of the reasons why we've, we've seen um, uh, in certain parts of Africa, uh, countries jumping a technological paradigm and where would you would have had a more complex value chain for audiovisual uh, output in the past, you now basically are relying on internet services to uh, pre-buy or buy your content in order to access your, your public and, and satisfy consumer demand. These people play a crucial role because they're making local content in local languages. Uh, Luganda may be spoken by 25 million people plus in terms of its non-participation in the g globalization, in economic globalization, it still makes it a minority language. Therefore, if it's not spoken, if it doesn't, if it's not used to reflect people's lives back at them, it's going to disappear or become marginalized. So the work they do on the ground is essential in, in the participation it, um, it constitutes. Uh, to maintaining linguistic diversity and cultural diversity. The trouble they have very often is that this, um, the content they make uh, is uh, vulnerable to market failure. And if they cannot find a buyer in the streaming environment, then they are left with, uh, with a very uh, problematic situation. One of the things they observe on the ground also is that the, the broadband mobile services that cus uh, consumers and citizens have access to, the pricing points are not always adequate to the spending power of local people. That if you need to spend uh, you know, seven Gs of your AG bundle you've pre-purchased uh, and that you've run out of, uh, of, of, of Gs by the time you reach episode two of a, of a, se of a series, there's something's not quite working with the adequation between supply and demand 
in in this uh, in this area. So uh, and also the quality reliability of the signal is up now. It's problematic. So back to perhaps what Constant, uh, Constantinos was saying, it's really is important to continue the work of deploying a, a, a reliable infrastructure with a variety of pricing points that reflect also the, purch the local purchasing power and to enable, again, the, the making of content that is culturally relevant. These people have made recently a film about a neurodivergent kid growing up in a traditional village in Uganda and subject to the prejudices of his, of his uh, milieu. And they, they regard their mission as being one of uh, educating and engaging people on women issues, on, on educational issues, and so on and so forth. If they don't have a sustainable uh, model to do it, then something is not quite working. So oh, oh, stay with the microphone there, because you brought up a very interesting point on just the economics and the challenges. In the very beginning of the internet, there was just this, this hope that we were democratizing and people be able to you know, find each other anywhere very easily. And part of our challenge now is the societal bubbles that we live in, that we to get our own, you know, the algorithm kind of repeats what we want to see over and over again. So in the case of like, I might want to watch this Ugandan you know, content, I didn't know it existed until now. How do they break through that barrier? I mean, is it, it isn't just a you know, network issue, it's also a just finding out that it's there and, and getting it out into the wild. Well, I mean, first of all, the, the, there is good news. Um, I, I can't remember who, we, uh, I think Jeff made the, made the point, which I think is a con contention point, uh, that there's a tendency of concentration in the marketplace for services. I sort of beg to differ. It's not that intense that there isn't competition arising. In fact, the rollout of the large American streamers in some of these markets has, has often triggered a kind of dynamic response with local services arising to kind of balance the equation. So they're finding these two ladies, and we'll talk about it tomorrow, that their situation compared to five years ago has, in, uh, has, has improved. They have more uh, markets they can go to to try and sort of uh, persuade someone to put money up front so that they can make the content in the first place. But it remains quite uh, at its first stage of development, and I think we need to see more competition in the type of service. That I There's two things that's really important here. One is we talk a lot about UGC, and we respect UGC, and our forms of licensing for UG UGC, as we've, as we've heard. It's a very important part of the creative ecosystem. But damn it, it's also a career for people. It's a professional career, and why not? Why could, not, could you not build sustainable audiovisual production businesses? at an SME level in the tier where you, you can be nimble, you can address different market segments, and you can make a living and pay your employees. Uh, and so, so that, that is a very important uh, notion to the people on the ground who are actually trying to, uh, to create career tracks uh, for, for this type, and uh, based on the, on the delivery of this type of content, based on living there and having their fingers on the cultural pulse and socioeconomic pulse. Thank you. Yep. So, you know, Bertrand, I, I really like your point about the market. The, the point you made about the markets, it, it, I, it really, it, it made me think, you know, to Constantino's point that we've always said we build the internet for users. And that's, a, that's a, something we, we, it's a truism. But it made me reflect that one of the things that is also true is that who that user that we build that f internet for has evolved and changed. When I started doing my career many years ago, that user at the other end was probably another computer scientist like myself. Now it's everybody. It's creators and it's the market. It's the people participating in the markets. These markets are built around these frameworks that we've created and enabled through the technology. But the user is a much more sophisticated, uh, very diverse entity now, right? It's, it's, the, it's the viewer, it's the creator, it's the creators that are also viewers. But it's these markets, at the end of the day, that are, are enabling the next generation, the next evolution of where we're going. It's you know because the market enables people to exchange and they, enables them to get paid for it, and that brings us back to the IP frameworks. That you know the IP networks enable the IP frameworks to enable the markets for all of us to participate in. And I used to go around saying everybody's a creator, and I think I'm going to go back to saying it because I think it's still true. Everybody is a creator, but the difference may be that I'm starting to get paid for it. <laughs> But there's a fundamental point here, Glenn, that I think is a shift of thinking in this digital world. The auto industry scaled up by making one car, one color, one artifact. 
they scaled by uniformity. The telephone system scaled to reach an astonishing number of people with one product, one concept. And so scale and uniformity went hand in hand. And I think we've grown into thinking that markets the size of billions is product the size of one. But what we're actually finding, and you can see it, I think, best in advertising networks, oddly enough, digital advertising, we are able to scale at billions, yet customise to a market of one. And if you think about how you can use a distributor like Netflix for my Ugandan language video, there is a conversation that works for both producer and distributor. The, what we're finding in this digital world is the power of this platform actually allows astonishingly fine-grained customization of individual markets inside this larger ecosystem. So it's, you can have any color you want, we don't care. We can produce the artifact at affordable price across a highly diverse market of billions and actually create sustaining businesses and supplying that, that, that system across the entire world. It is a different way of thinking. And, and I'm personally quite optimistic about this. It's no longer one car, one size, one thing. It is actually a market where we can do highly diverse, highly customizable inside one framework. And that's where we're exploring right now. And I think we'll explore over the next five or so years. And, and oddly enough, things like copyright really help because all of a sudden these authors and producers can say, I'm a market of one with my copyright. And the distributor goes, sure, I can accommodate that within the frameworks we have that service billions of people. And, and, and this is kind of where we're heading with this technology. It is amazing stuff, I believe. Thanks for that. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that and then we're going to go to another question. Microphone. About the, the market um, discussion, I think there is um, a point that was never raised. I only mentioned that there are different stakeholders in, in the value chain and with different position. There are no uh, first row artists here in the room and on the panel, so I need to anyway highlight the fact that we are talking about extremely positive situation, and I think the focus of our debate was the, b the larger, I mean, IP system versus uh, development on the internet. What is the impact uh, on content production and access? So the, the picture is extremely positive. However, in all this debate, if you talk to musicians, so if you talk to artists, sometimes they don't feel well treated and they don't get um, the money they think they deserve or they're used to get from traditional media, from digital exploitation. This is a fact, it's debated, it's discussed, there are people uh, negotiating that. I think it's mostly a matter of uh, bargaining power, discussion, according to direct deals, um, the trend is positive, but there is discussion over there. One question we ask those that are involved with policy and not with business deals is, um, if not mistaken, I haven't checked, but I think 13 years ago, the uh, subscription fee of uh, certain streaming services was exactly the same as of today. No, not mistaken. Uh, I, I, I don't, I want to quote specifically, I mean, but been my a sense is that the pri price stabilization, price a little bit up, that, yeah, just come on. How much? I, and they stopped sending uh, vi Very yes, similar, people, certainly right. not at the pace of, <laughs> of inflation. But uh, on the other hand, the content you get is certainly increased, so you have uh, double. So is it, um, is it uh, uh, sustainable in terms of like, we have more product, more content, Users get uh, to do uh, more stakeholders, same price or almost same price. How far we can go in that model? And we leave it to, my, that's my, it's a question. I don't have the answer. Do you want just, just very quickly, I think this is a competition issue, right? I mean, the market will sort it out. We, and we are seeing already some services survive and some services just die the quick death in the, in the case of Quibi, for instance, <laughs> right? So I think that this is, 
we're going to go through a phase in where I feel that we are already in, into the phase of a hype where everyone wants to do streaming because it's the new golden thing and then some players will survive and some players will don't and content will play the predominant role in order to determine which ones will survive or not as well as the engineering behind it and whether you are able to support what you tell me, what you're selling me uh, and you want me to buy. Do you want to comment on just how much content's being done? We were talking about this the other day. It's just amazing. Uh, sure, I, I don't have numbers to, to, to you know, concept to, to, to think. But conceptually, we're in a golden age of content creation. There is more content being created, both professionally and non-professionally, than ever in the history of mankind. It's, yeah, I, I don't know if this is sustainable. I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer, but wow. I mean, you know, look back. Uh, in years to come and say there was this explosion uh, in the 2020s of content everywhere like we've never seen before. I, when I was a kid growing up, you know, you, you maybe got a new TV show here and there and you're kind of very excited in the fall when the new shows would come out. And now I'm, I'm in this 24-7 cycle, 365 year where I'm always finding new content constantly. It's, it's amazing. But don't you think that this is also because the creation of content it has become much cheaper because of the internet? Absolutely. And you know, I, 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 somebody else pointed out to me the other day that there's a, uh, a new tool that came out for your phone that you can now do cinematic quality video capture and processing. I think it has an AI component on the back end that it's, it's literally like a cinematic quality camera. And if you, if you think about that, you know, 10 years ago, we would have been talking about the RED camera professionally, which was like, you know, a very expensive, very unique tool. And now we, people have it in their hand in their phone and it's a downloadable app. I, I, I think it may even be free. Like, wow. <laughs> uh, thank Ah, thanks so much, uh, Shannon. My, my name is Talan Sultanov from Internet Society Kyrgyz Chapter, and I wanted to follow up actually on your question on uh, Global South uh, and uh, contribute to this debate on copyright. So our work uh, was mostly related to connecting the remote communities of Kyrgyzstan to the Internet, and once we did that, we quickly realized there wasn't much content for the local communities because everything was in, in Russian or in English and people wanted content in Kyrgyz language. And we thought it, it would be easy. We will digita digitize, for example, educational materials that Ministry of Education has, books. And we couldn't because th they were all copyright protected. So we asked the Ministry of Education, can you give us the copyright? They said, they be it belongs to the authors. So the ministry pays to have these books, but doesn't want to have the copyright, because uh, then the responsibility of the quality of the book goes to the ministry, and they, they want to have, no, if there is a mistake, it was the mistake by the author, it's not us, the Ministry of Education. Uh, but uh, for us, it was a challenge. We couldn't digitize these textbooks, uh, and it was actually for us easier to find uh, copyright-free creative commons materials from the global experience and then uh, translate it into Kyrgyz language rather than digitizing the uh, textbooks that were produced um, locally. So I think uh, having Creative Commons materials was a really kind of lifesaver for us. Thank you. Has that market changed since you first started on that? Have you found that there's more in the Creative Commons than when you first were trying to use copyrighted work? Um, now we are finding a lot of useful materials uh, globally. For example, we've adopted uh, GSMA's mobile internet uh, toolkit into Kyrgyz language, uh, Microsoft's uh, you know, materials. Uh, they were all, uh, of course, by commercial companies, but uh, openly available. Uh, also, we wanted to bring uh, scientific experiments to schools, rural schools. We thought we would produce them by ourselves, but it was uh, f very expensive. So we found uh, biology, astronomy, physics, experiments, videos, five minute, three minute videos uh, online, Creative Commons, and we translated them into Kyrgyz language using um, uh, voices of uh, real uh, of, uh, st local stars. 
So in the end, the, these videos were even more uh, kind of user-friendly than the original, because the originals were voiced by scientists, and this time they, these were voiced by actors. Uh, and I just wanted to end uh, with, uh, through our work for us, we developed several kind of principles that we've been applying now. One was uh, local language first, so anything we do, in, we now do in Kyrgyz language. Then mobile first, because uh, rural communities have very few computers, but everybody uses smartphones. And this means, for example, if we do textbooks, they can't be just PDF, they have to be kind of, you, you have to be able to kind of make the font smaller, larger, and they cannot be very heavy. So the, for example, during COVID, Ministry of Education scanned all the books that they have, but they were so heavy and the kids, when they download one book, all their money was gone, so they couldn't use it. Uh, same for video, and we found ways to make them very light uh, without losing the quality. Yeah. Uh, I just want to jump in here and say, so one of my other hats is I'm a, one of the ITF trustees, and one of the ITF trustees, what we actually do is we manage the IP rights, the, the copyrights on all the technical standards that the ITF produces. I just want to chime in and say, uh, when, you, when you get to the ITF standards, one of the things we have pre-baked into the authorized uses is you can translate them to any language you like. It's already enabled and already permission already granted. So when you get to the ITF RFCs, you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We have a question down here. And can do you mind just identifying yourself? Sorry, I didn't get asked either gentleman to do that. It's fine. It, it just push the button up. There you go. It works, yes. Thank you, you very much. My name is Peter Bruck. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards, and uh, we have started in 2003 with a business process uh, to give uh, a global or to start a global mechanism of looking at high quality content. Uh, and uh, in the first year, we had 136 countries participating in 2003, and then today it's 182 countries, and we have a United Nations system so that from each country, so uh, talent, if he's working from Kyrgyzstan, he has one in the eight categories of the Tunis Action Plan and uh, the same as from the US or from Australia or from anywhere else. What uh, I'm struck, uh, I'm actually struck in awe by the quality of your conversation here and I have not been privy and part of it before. I, and uh, what I want to address here very much is uh, the technologically uh, fueled enthusiasm of uh, Geoff Houston uh, regarding uh, different ways of thinking and uh, how the technology is actually turning, uh, I mean, the table, I mean, upside down every three or five years. Obviously, what we have is when we look at quality of content, we have a promise, and uh, Jeff, you related it to the library model of the internet, you know, shifting it then to the entertainment model, and you referred then also to the mobile revolution. What uh, the business process started off is actually looking at this transformation through the internet into a knowledge society. So that was the idea of the computerization, you know, of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I guess. Uh, what we see here is that the market is actually very successful and many of you have really, I mean, uh, stressed how um, from copyright, you know, I think, uh, Paolo, you did your three things regarding how the last 10 years have really, I mean, shown in terms of user-generated content, in terms of open source and so on, how this has actually really helped us shape the market in a um, positive way. But I would think that we have uh, not a market failure, but a democracy failure. And uh, the issue here is very much that uh, the platform intermediaries, which uh, Jeff is also talking about, and who have such a critical role, they have cannibalized the editorial intermediaries. And that is something which we have to really, I mean, start thinking about in terms of what uh, you were talking about also, Shannon, uh, regarding the democracy issue. So we are basically creating, you know, I mean, not just uh, one product uh, for, for one taste uh, in, on a scale of billions, but we are creating also 
uh, social monads uh, which are not relating to each other in a participatory way but they are paralleling each other in their existence and then they are I mean, fueled by, and I don't want to go into all the details of the analysis here, but it is, for my question is, uh, what is it actually in terms of uh, the positive thinking and what the technology can deliver and what the economics can sustain in terms of quality content regarding what I would think is something like the editorial value add. And that would relate then to something like the enlightenment idea of the public sphere, but I don't want to go into that either. So thank you very much for listening to this. No, I appreciate your comments. I'm just gonna check back in over here. Luke, did you want to add anything? You've been very patient through all this whole conversation. You've got a microphone right next to you right there. I just do have one question. I mean, coming from a youth perspective and about copyright. So on Instagram, there actually is a function to add a sort of audio that you do have to a reel. So when content creators, um, I'm just curious that, uh, let's say you have a song and you record the song, but you upload it as your, your own audio. So uh, what, what is the process then and what happens and how do we educate the youth to better maybe follow the best practices that are already in place, but the youth may not know about these practices. Yeah. Great, I think we know who that goes to. <laughs> we, just, we can do copyright clinics uh, at the IGF. I think it uh, would be extremely useful. I should suggest that. <laughs> Look, um, you're talking about uh, your originally created music uploaded on Instagram? Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, it's something that is, I, mm, I must say, I don't know the details of the terms of use, but it's something very similar to what happens on YouTube whenever you upload uh, your, your video. Through that process, you are basically um, <laughs> there is a disclaimer. You have to you have to uh, assert you have the rights over that piece of music you are uploading. That's the first thing. If you have the right, you are signing up a non-exclusive uh, licensing agreement through which basically you allow Instagram to to make it available. And unless you have uh, a specific content ID or you are, you are a professional author, you art artist, you, you oftentimes uh, don't get any good economic deals out of it. So uh, it's a good start to make, to, make, um, uh, to make yourself known to outreach the audience. Uh, but what we see is that professional artists normally get a specific deal in order to get some of the revenues generated through advertisement whenever your music is played. So read carefully the terms of use, and if you are planning to be a professional artist, then read even more carefully and ask someone <laughs> to help you. But it's basically, it's a copyright licensing, and once you upload that, you can also go somewhere else and do it if it's your song. But first step, you need to make sure it's your creation. All right, we are at time. Thank you all for being part of this very uh, good discussion. It looks like we survived the last 10 years. I'm hoping that we can do this again in another 10 and, and see where we have come in. So I just want to appreciate everyone's time this morning. Thank you, Jeff, for coming in remotely. And thank you for all of you who are participating here in the audience and those that, are, that helped us coordinate all this. So have a good day at the IGF. Thank you. <laughs>